Let's see, it was seven years ago when I met two people that would change my life forever. Uh, one was on stage singing in the band, and uh, this person absolutely had captured my full attention. And I was just a college guy at the time uh, in my senior year, and this person was Trina. And I met her at our first advanced conference, which was a conference for college-aged young people. And we started dating a few months later. And at the same time, I met Scott Artavanis. And uh, one of them drew me with their looks and the other with uh, maybe their personality. I'll let you figure out which was which. But um, Scott and Patty have been a mentor, mentoring couple to Trina and I for seven or eight years now. In fact, for years, I've said, hey, top five influential people in my life. Tanner, who led me to faith. This pastor, this pastor, Scott, and another. And so even from this far away, Scott's been a real mentor to me. And just can't believe that we're here. We've already been here seven or eight months. And uh, just a quick little highlight, we bought a home recently and we live right across the street from Blake Boys. And my son was already obsessed with Blake. He, he just loves Pastor Blake. Pastor Blake is his hero. And now we've got a, a little tree house, uh, you know, playground. And he gets up in there and he spies on Blake when he mows his lawn <laughs> and when he gets in his car. And he just talks about Pastor Blake all the time. And so anyways, it's just we feel real settled and it's been a lot of fun. We went and rode trains with the boys family on Saturday. And if you know my son, he loves little trains and he got to drive the train and Blake was on the train. And so I think it was the best day of his life uh, for sure. But uh, I, I do want to transition us now to our time in the word. And, uh, and the first thing I want to start with is just considering the question, why did he do it? Why did he do it? Was it because of difficult working circumstances? Was it because his master was too hard on him? Was it because he just had a desire for pleasure and autonomy or freedom? Maybe he was just tired of working hard. He was wicked, lazy, ungrateful, and he saw his opportunity to split. We don't know for sure why the slave Onesimus ran away from his owner Philemon. But what we do know is that that wasn't the end of the story. I want to introduce you to this young man named Onesimus, and in the college group back home, we would call him Onesie Moose, but that is not a correct pronunciation. It is Onesimus and his buddy Onesie Forrest in 1 Timothy, also not a correct pronunciation. Onesimus is his name, and one day he had enough of the life that God had given him. He decided he had had enough, and so he ran away, and in the process of running away, he stole a lump sum of money, as far as we can tell, too. Maybe he went by night and he caught the first ship that he could and he was heading west to get as far away from his hometown, that area near Colossae or Laodicea, that he could possibly go. And so if you were running away, where would you want to go? Well, you'd want to go to somewhere where you could spend your money, where you could have a chance at freedom to start a new beginning at the same time where he could hide. Where do you think he went? Well, he went to Rome, where everyone would go in this day and age. Rome was the metropolis city, the capital of the Roman Empire. Now, understand this. At this time, a runaway slave uh, did not run away without consequence. If the slave was rebellious, the master had complete, absolute authority over his life. He could terminate him. Uh, if he wanted to be gracious, what they would do, though, upon receiving a runaway slave, they would brand an F on their forehead. And that F stood for the word uh, that was basically the word for fugitive. Now, if a slave had stolen something, they could brand an FR, which again represented the word for thief. And so in Onesimus's case, best case scenario, if he's caught, he's taken back to the Colossae area, he's branded, he's beaten, and his life is worse than before. That's best case scenario. Worst case scenario, he's a dead man. And so he goes to Rome to disappear. He wants to hide, he wants to start a new beginning. Bounty hunters are out to get him. And lo and behold, the sovereignty of God is going to enter in a mighty way. Now, at the same time, isn't it like God to be doing more than one thing at a time, right? At the same time, there was a man who was on the road to Damascus. And you know the story. Acts chapter 9. A man named Saul is persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. He's a Pharisee. He's, he's approving of the death of Christians, and Jesus Christ appears to him in a miraculous vision. He's converted, and he's appointed to be a chosen instrument for the Gentiles. Paul is that uh, unique apostle, the 13th apostle, who's not for the Jews, but who's specifically for the Gentiles. And thus, though he would try to minister to Jews, there was closed doors there because God wanted him for 
the rest of the world. Now, Paul would eventually go on to have a very bountiful and fruitful gospel ministry, but by the time Acts 21 rolls around, and you can begin to open to Acts, uh, he's in prison, or he's at least on trial, headed to prison. From Acts 21 till the end of the book of Acts, he's being tried from one ruler to the next, and he's actually having opportunities to proclaim the gospel over and over and over again from one ruler to the next. And eventually he finds his way to Rome. Let's go to Acts 28. He finds his way to Rome, where he's now put on house arrest. It's from Rome that he would write what are called the prison epistles. There's four of them. You just finished one of them called Colossians. And our letter tonight will be in the same vein. But let me just show you something in Acts 28. Look at verse 23. I just want to show you a little bit of the scope of his ministry while he's in Rome. Acts 28, verse 23 says, When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers. Okay, so he's in house arrest. He can't leave. But people are coming to him. And look, from morning until evening, he expounded to them testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus. (laughs) So people are coming to him who are unbelievers. And I don't know if he's speaking out from his balcony or if there's a patio or if he can kind of venture out or go through the window. But somehow Paul is able to speak not just to one or two, but to masses of people from his lodging quarters. And was it, look at the text, was it just for an hour or two? Or what did it say? From morning until evening. He is trying to convince and persuade people to follow Jesus. And how is he doing it? Look at the text from the law of Moses and the prophets. He's using his Old Testament to demonstrate that the promised Messiah of old is in fact Jesus of Nazareth, whom was crucified. Verse 24, how did it go? Well, some were convinced by what he said and others disbelieved. I'm actually more encouraged by the fact that some were convinced. Now, how many of the masses were convinced? We don't know. But even if he was just converting a few a day or a few a week, if he's doing this week after week, look down at verse 30. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. So this ministry of Paul is going from morning to evening. It goes on for two years. And what's he doing? 31, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. With all boldness and without hindrance. Guys, this is really amazing to think that in the sovereignty of God now, Paul is in Rome and his ministry is actually being magnified. It's being multiplied. And this is where our two characters now are going to intersect. Onesimus is in Rome. Paul is in Rome. And one way or another, this runaway, fugitive, stealing slave stumbles upon the gospel ministry of the one and only Apostle Paul. Now, just as we get into a little bit of interpretation, some have thought that maybe Onesimus sought him out. I find that hard to believe, considering he just ran away from a Christian master and that he likely stole a bunch of money from him. Others have thought that maybe he ended up in prison and was alongside Paul. Well, once again, hard to believe because Paul was in a unique scenario. He's a high-profile person, and he's in a house on house arrest. So more likely that Onesimus is actually just out and about, and he hears a man preaching, he sees a crowd gathered, he comes over, and lo and behold, he's converted. (laughs) Not only does he hear the gospel, but he repents and believes his life has changed. He was an old, old dead sinner, and now he's risen and resurrected to new life in Christ. Thus, Onesimus, this runaway fugitive slave, becomes a Christian. Again, just pause. What a marvelous display of the sovereignty of God, weaving lives together for his glory. Weaving the divine tapestry together, using people's lives, all for his glory. Now, following this conversion, I'm just giving you a little bit of a running start background. There's no doubt that Paul discipled Onesimus. This was not just like an evangelistic crusade where he hears and then he goes on his way. No, no, no. They're going to spend intimate time together. And I just have to conjecture for a moment. I wonder what this went like. Imagine Onesimus is part of the crowd. He hears the message of the gospel. He repents and believes. And then he's welcomed into Paul's home. And they're there sitting and they're in their first discipleship session. Okay, well, Onesimus, tell me about yourself. Oh, well, I just arrived here in Rome uh, and I came from the east. Oh, really? Where did you come from in the east? And what did you do? Oh, well, I was, you know, in that area of Colossae. And actually, Paul, I was a slave. Oh, you were a slave. Well, how did you end up here? 
Uh, were you, were, did you buy your freedom or were you set free? Well, no, actually I, uh, I ran away and I stole a bunch of money in the process. And uh, yeah, it's probably not good, is it? Oh, interesting. Let me jot that down for a moment here. Now, who did you say your master was? Oh, his name was Philemon. You don't mean Philemon, who was married to Aphia around the area of Colossae, do you? Yeah, actually, Paul, that's the one. Onesimus, you're not going to believe this, but I led Philemon, that very man, to faith and his wife and his son. Oh, the great people, great, wonderful people. Onesimus, let's talk about this. I think we've got some good work to do together. Now, I don't know exactly how that talk went, but at some point, these two get together and they both become convinced that what? That Onesimus needs to go back. That this runaway fugitive fugitive slave needs to return back to his master named Philemon, clear back east over in Colossae. So, the, why, who was convinced first? We don't know whether it was Philemon's con, or sorry, Onesimus's conscience or Paul's conscience. But we do know this: they both believed that. Why? Because Paul wrote the letter, and Onesimus went back. Don't forget, guys. Paul has no power to keep this man in his house. He's in house arrest, and this guy just escaped his owner. He'd be very capable of running away. They're both convinced he needs to go back. And that really sets us up for our letter. So turn over to the book of Philemon. It's past Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, all the T's, Thessalonians, and the Timothys, just before Hebrews. It's the last of Paul's letters that's recorded in our, at least last in order. It's also the shortest at just one chapter. Paul is the uncontested author of this short letter of Philemon. Again, just one chapter in length. He's in house arrest in Rome. And there are some who have tried to argue that, well, maybe he's in house arrest in Caesarea. No, it's a poor argument. That's not the case. Some have said maybe in Ephesus. Well, there's no evidence he was ever imprisoned in Ephesus. So he is undoubtedly in Rome during the writing of this. And his purpose is simple. On the basis of a prior friendship, Paul writes to appeal to the slave owner Philemon to receive back Onesimus and to treat him as a brother on Paul's behalf. So he's writing to Philemon, the slave owner, to receive back Onesimus and to treat him now as a brother, a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Our outline is also simple. He's going to praise Philemon's spiritual character. He's going to plead to Philemon to forgive and receive back Onesimus. And then he's going to pledge to Philemon as further motivation toward obedience. We'll work through these one by one, though. So let's begin in verse 1 as part of the introduction. He says, as his usual opening, Paul, that's our author, but then look what he says. He says, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. Now, this is, I believe, the only letter where Paul does not refer to himself as an apostle. Most of the time, he's trying to build up his credentials. He wants to write with authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Here, he says, a prisoner. A prisoner. And I think that's important because what we're going to find in this letter is that Paul is doing anything but being authoritative. He's not coming in heavy handed. In fact, he's coming in just as a friend, just as a friend with an appeal. And next week, we're going to see an important lesson for the way that we lead people toward obedience as well. But here, Paul is not being heavy handed. He's actually appealing to him and he calls himself a prisoner. A prisoner. Now, why is he referring to himself as a prisoner? Well, again, this is a little bit of an allusion to Paul's own suffering and sacrifice, which is going to come into play when he appeals to Philemon to sacrifice himself. So he says, Paul, a prisoner to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. He's not just a Christian, but he's involved in ministry. Look at verse 2. And Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. So he's writing to Philemon and we see, hey, this is a good guy. This guy's not only a Christian, he's not only a worker, but church is at his house, right? I mean, that's a level of service and commitment to the Lord and his purposes. Now, who are these other two mentioned in verse two? Aphia, most have conjectured that this is probably Philemon's wife, and then Archippus, probably his son. Reason being that there's no other evidence or no other description given, and they're right after Philemon. So possibly his wife and his son, in one way or another, they're all believers, which again would fit in line with Acts, where you have entire households repenting and believing. In fact, the Marx family, right, Tana? I mean, you're, you're part of this in a sense. Your husband came to faith, and then 
Who was next? His parents came to faith, and his older brother came to faith, and now their younger brother came to faith, and maybe his grandfather came to faith. And it's not that Derek's salvation brought the whole thing and just covered everyone. No, but as one person was born again, that message spread. In the same way, I think we probably have an example of that here, all through the ministry of Paul. Just really amazing, again, the the sovereignty of God. And then he closes the introduction, look at verse 3, with saying, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul's common introduction. He's simply asking that grace would abound and peace would abound in their lives. Now, as we move into our first consideration, we see the praise of Philemon's spiritual character. And as we consider these four verses, I've already told you the point of the letter. He's making an appeal. So he's eventually going to get to an appeal. But again, consider what he does first. He actually praises him first. And... I might even add, ladies, it might be helpful for us to think about in our lives an instance where someone in our life is in need of steering, (laughs) they're in need of directing, they're in need of guidance, and perhaps this is your husband or your father-in-law or someone who it's maybe a little easier to be forceful with, to be straightforward, black and white with. You know they're wrong. Clearly they're wrong. In fact, if they continue in this, there may even be sin involved. And so you're just going to cut it to them straight. You're just going to be black and white. I'm just going to be blunt about it and direct. And I'm going to tell you, you're wrong. You need to do this. And I'm going to be just straightforward about it. Before we go that direction, not that there's not a time and place for that, but I want us to consider the fact that Paul is about to appeal to him. And look at how he begins this. Again, there's lessons for us here. And I think even how we lead people to obedience. Look at verse 4, the opening words. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. What a compliment. (laughs) What an interesting way to start an appeal, borderline a rebuke, is he says, I thank my God always in remembrance of you. Have you ever been told... Maybe something like this. Denise, I just appreciate the way that you serve. When I see you serve, it encourages me to serve more. Or Patty, I just, I love the way that you love people. It's such an encouragement to my own heart. And I just see the fruit of the Spirit in both of you. Now, when you hear something like that, I think that naturally we're encouraged, right? We're built up because it's not saying, hey, I like your hairdo or I like your shoes. There's actually something that's meaningful in that compliment. Well, notice the, the, the type of compliment, the type of praise that he's giving here. Verse 5, hey, I'm thanking God for you, Philemon, because I hear of your love and of your faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus. I hear of your love and your faith. Consider then Paul's shepherding heart. He's going to engage Philemon, but first he's going to build him up and say, here's what I've noticed. It's good. And oh, by the way, I'm praying for you. Bear in mind, Philemon's probably worked up at this point, right? His slave ran away. He ran off. He took some money. In fact, Philemon renders him useless. And yet Paul just diffuses right? Signs of good peacemakers. You know, when people are in conflict, sometimes there's a mediator. A good peacemaker is one who can diffuse the situation. Paul says, hey, I just thank God for you, Philemon. And in fact, I'm thanking God because of your love and because of your faith. I'm just thankful. You're just growing, right? Philemon was not a stagnant Christian. He was a growing Christian. And Paul wants him to know that. But now look at what he's actually going to move toward. He's thanking God for certain things, for his love and his faith toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. But in verse six, he's praying that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Now, this is a little bit hard to understand what's going on here when you begin to to study and and try to interpret this. Let me tell you what I think it's saying, and then I'll tell you why. I think he's actually saying, Philemon, I'm praying that your faith would work. I'm praying that your faith would actually manifest itself in, in working in what I'm about to appeal to you to do. Okay, let me tell you why. Verse six, I pray that the sharing of your faith, that word sharing is the word fellowship. It's the word fellowship, which can also be translated participation or activeness, right? So I'm praying that you would engage or participate in your faith. Next phrase. And that you may become effective in this. So he's praying for a working out of his faith, we might say. A working out of his faith in accordance with full knowledge of what he knows to be true. 
Okay, so he, he's praying for his actions to match what he believes. And by the way, finally, man, this is going to require your full theological spectrum. You're going to have to think hard here on what I'm about to ask you to do. It's going to be hard. And that's why he's praying for full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Verse 7, look at it. First word is the word for. I have derived much joy and comfort from your love. So there's something to do with his love being manifested to others because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So Philemon's already living out his true faith. He is working in accordance with his faith. But Paul is praying for more because Philemon, you're going to need a full dose of that in light of what I'm about to ask you to do. Philemon had been gracious. And in fact, he'd been a refresher. And just to pause, I think what a neat compliment. Again, how would you like to be the person who everyone says, man, when I go over to their house, I'm just refreshed. They're just so hospitable and kind and gracious. I just feel built up spiritually when I'm at that person's house. That's why this is still part of the, the praise, right? He's praising Philemon, verse 7. Listen, people's hearts are refreshed. The saints are refreshed. They're deriving. I've derived joy. Others have derived joy from you. But here you go, Philemon. You're going to need it for what I'm about to do. We transition now to the plea in verses 8 through 16. And the plea begins with the word accordingly in verse 8 or the word therefore. Now, ladies, when there's a therefore, what do you do? You see what it's there for. So there's clearly a connection with what he's just been saying and what he's about to do. Look at verse 8. Accordingly, or therefore, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. These same qualities that were just listed are going to be needed for what he's going to ask him to do. Therefore, he says, hey, according to how I've been praying for you, here's the appeal. He hasn't given the appeal yet, but we're almost there. Now, one more thing, just observation-wise, ladies. I just want to say this. The contrast that we're about to see here between Paul and his authority and the way that he actually does this is a greater contrast than any of us will ever experience in our life. Here's what I mean. Paul had greater authority. He had greater spiritual privileges. He had greater spiritual access. Even we might say he had seen the Lord Jesus in person. He had done miracles. He had led hundreds to faith. He was an apostle. So if anyone in the Christian faith has had pull or weight, it was him. And yet how he does it, sadly, <laughs> is more humble and gentle than most Christians do this today. I might even say most pastors do this today. So again, if Paul, having the authority that he has, can appeal with humility and gentleness and graciousness, how much more ought we to appeal when resolving a conflict or approaching someone regarding sin? He's very tender. He's very caring. He's very shepherding. He's sensitive, we might say. He has empathy. He's entering into the emotions to the potential loss of Philemon, and he's doing so with utmost graciousness. Now, to understand Philemon, you got to understand, he had a right to be angry. A slave in this day, I mean, you look up different numbers. 60,000 was one number. 156,000 was another number. I mean, these were, this was a huge chunk that had run out the door when Onesimus left. At the same time, he had lost labor for up to two years. And not to mention, Philemon's a Christian man. He's potentially relationally hurt by one of his slaves. I mean... I hesitate to say employee, but maybe a similar scenario in some ways had walked out the door without telling him and stolen money from him. Philemon has some wrestling to do. And so Paul's being very tender here with this dear man. And he says, look back at the text, verse nine, for love's sake, for love's sake, my love for you, Philemon, is why I'm doing this. And I think we'd do well to learn a lesson from that. Now, before he gets to the appeal, one final observation. I, Paul, and he's going to point out two characteristics that, again, help with the motivation. They help with uh, the urgency and even the, the response to the appeal. He says, I'm an old man and I'm a prisoner. I think when he says, Paul the aged or Paul the old man, he's referring to the fact that, hey, guys, I've been doing this a long time. And in 30 years of ministry, I've been mocked. I've been beaten. I've been shipwrecked and stoned. I've been thrown out of cities. 
I've been through a lot for the name of Jesus. I have sacrificed, which is made even stronger by the fact that now, even right now, he's a prisoner. Paul knew what it was to suffer for Jesus. He knew what it was to sacrifice for Jesus. And that is very fitting in light of what he's about to ask him to do. Paul is appealing to the credibility of his own experience of faithful ministry, and that gives all the more punch to verse 10. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. So immediately, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm imagining the reaction, <laughs> I'm imagining the reaction of Philemon. Whoa, whoa, did you just say Onesimus? Wasn't that the slave that I had that ran away? 150000 out the door, plus whatever money he stole, plus the labor... Oh, Paul Onesimus. Did you just call him? What was Paul's relationship to Onesimus? Look at the two words. Did you just call him your child whom I have begotten or whose father I have become? There's got to be somewhat of a shock happening right now. Now, not only that, but I want you to consider this. Look at verse 12 or verse 11. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and me. I'm sending him back to you and sending my very heart Philemon received this letter at the same time that he received Onesimus. <laughs> I mean, as you dig into the context here, I'm thinking, whoa, what would that have been like? Imagine Philemon's out in his field and he's working. He's working in his farm. And he looks up and down the long driveway comes Tychicus. Oh, okay, that guy works with Paul. I wonder what he's doing. There's another man with him though. And as they draw nearer, he realizes it's not just Tychicus, but a two. It's Onesimus, his runaway slave. I mean, I have to wonder, conjecture, does his blood start to boil a little bit? Is he already getting angry at, what? Onesimus is coming down my driveway? And again, Tychicus is standing there with Onesimus. He says, Paul, or sorry, Philemon, before you react, I just want you to read this. Here you go. It's from Paul. (laughs) You might want to read that first. Well, Paul had led had led this man to faith, and so he breaks open the letter. And again, is, is, is Onesimus standing right there? Very plausibly, plausibly, actually very likely. And so he's reading this very letter, and in all likelihood, Onesimus is standing right there. I appeal to you, verse 10, for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to me, and I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. Guys, this is again validating something I said earlier, which is that Paul spent time with this man. He did not just preach the gospel and say, go on your way. He discipled this man. How else could it be that he would say, I'm sending my very heart? This was another dear disciple of the apostle Paul. In fact, so dear was he to him that look at verse 13, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve with me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. This man had gone from being useless to useful. In fact, there's a pun happening here. Uh, If you look at verse, this was funny to read as well. If you look at verse 10, you see the word Onesimus. Onesimus means useful one. It means useful one. And there's a little bit of a a poem here or a, a play on words. Paul says, useful one, verse 11, who formerly was useless to you, but now he's indeed useful to me and to you. Right? He's doing this on purpose, a little bit tongue-in-cheek here, with the pun on his, on his name. This one, Paul had trained, he had invested in. And again, it's just kind of humorous to think, Paul was in the prison in Rome. And while the Romans thought they were containing this apostle in his ministry and the spread of Christianity, what was God doing? <laughs> he was doing the exact opposite. He was actually spreading it all the more. It's kind of like reverse missions. Here Paul was trying to go out through the whole known world, and God's bringing them right to his prison cell from all nations. It's reverse missions. In fact, the only time I've, I've really heard of something like this would be when you have some sort of international ministry outreach. This is something that we did back in Bozeman, Montana. We saw a need on our campus, Montana State, 16,000 students, of which there were 600 international students that would come every year from all over the world. Now, bear in mind, who do they send over? They don't just send anyone over. These are the best and the brightest of each country, right? Those who can actually afford it and who get the best grades and are able to come. And so they come to a university. It's like, hey, 
let's try to make an impact. So we started a ministry. We put a few volunteers there. Next thing you know, we hired a person. We hired two people. And by the end, there were two people with about 30 volunteers having weekly Bible studies with students from Saudi Arabia and China and Japan and all over the nation or all over over the globe. Well, in, in not only the same way, but perhaps even greater, Paul is sitting in a house and people from the whole world are coming to him. He's preaching the gospel. He's making disciples and then he's sending them back. And here's an example right here with Onesimus. He has made disciples from prison. <laughs> really amazing when you look at that. So, A lot going on here, but again, this is now part of the plea, right? We've moved from from his praise of Philemon. Now we're getting into the plea. Paul has sent him back to his own detriment. And look now at the plea, verse 14. I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bond servant, and here's the plea, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. This is within the plea portion, and Paul begins to get to his plea here. He's saying, Philemon, you need to receive this guy back, and don't just let him live, but you need to receive him as a brother. Recognize that this man standing in front of you, he's a changed man. He's a changed man. Now, as as we look at this and as I study this, there's some things that are unclear and there's some things that are clear. So let me start with that which is clear. It's clear that Paul did not keep Onesimus with him, though he wanted to and probably could have. He sent him back because it was the right thing to do. Under Roman law, you had to send a slave back. Furthermore, under God's law, God's will is that we make reconciliation. If you've sinned, if you've done wrong, you go back and you make it right. So Paul sends him back. It's also clear that Paul wants to give Philemon an opportunity to do good. Now, we don't know what that good is, but he's trying to give him an opportunity to do something good. It's also clear that Paul doesn't really know what God's will for Onesimus is. Look at 15 again. For this, for this perhaps, <laughs> is why he was parted from us. I love when you see phrases like that, perhaps, or it just so happened. Usually these are indicators that God's behind it. Right? It's actually speaking of the providence of God. And so Paul is directing Philemon's mind to God's providence. Hey, listen, I don't have a, a plan laid out for this guy. He's useful, but ultimately it's God's will. Maybe he'll be back with you forever. Now, lastly, what also is clear is that Paul wants Philemon to recognize that Onesimus is a changed man. Right? He's a brother, verse 16, and he's in the Lord, verse 16. Now, what's less clear that we'll get into next week when we do implications of this is what does Paul actually think should happen? What would Paul's preference be? And we might even just be blunt. What does Paul think about slavery in general? Right. This is a little bit more of a a complex and difficult question to think through. I know you just studied Colossians chapter three, right? You finished Colossians and in Colossians, he addresses who? Masters and who else? Slaves. Now, here's an interesting thing to think on. Was Onesimus with Paul when he wrote that? Was Onesimus perhaps some of the inspiration at a human level for some of the things that Paul knew how to direct and address? Obviously, the Holy Spirit wrote that, but fun to think about. Maybe Paul had long talks with Onesimus about the struggles of being a slave, and thus he exhorts them, you need to obey your masters in everything. In any case, we know that Paul actually just, he, hey, he's not trying to undo the social construct of the Roman slavery system. In fact, to do so would have been counterproductive to the message of the gospel, right? If they tried to take on this whole system with 60 million slaves, one out of three people were a slave, it actually would have undermined the credibility of the gospel. And yet, what does Paul actually think about slavery? Well, again, I'll leave that for next week. And at the same time, I want to ask the question next week, what does God think about slavery? What does God think about slavery? And what about all that's going on today with Black Lives Matter and social justice and all this? I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver, but we're going to hit on some of that next week. So there's the advertisement. Come back. Regardless of what Paul's view is or God's view, we'll get to that later, we know this. It's clear that Paul wants Philemon to change the way that he's relating to this slave Onesimus. He's not to be an object. He's not to be mistreated, but he's to be viewed as an equal when it comes to spiritual 
privilege. Are you with me there? Galatians 3, I think, is a key text that comes to my mind on this issue when Paul, again writing to the Galatians in verse 28, says, There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, this equality and this unity certainly does not undo the distinctions here. Just because someone comes to Christ doesn't mean that they're no longer a Jew or no longer a Gentile, which is everyone else. Nor does it mean that when a man comes to Christ or a female comes to Christ, that that means that they're no longer their various, you know, male or female. No, uh, it's just saying that they have equal privilege and unity. Well, the same is true then of a slave and a free person. It's not that he's trying to necessarily undo that, but hey, you all need to be viewed as equally important and have equal privileges on a spiritual level. Now, let's go back to Philemon, and we're going to move now to the third paragraph, and really the third part of this letter, this one chapter letter, and that is the pledge. It's the pledge to Philemon as further motivation toward obedience. What he's driving at in verse 21 is obedience, but he's going to make a pledge first. And so look at verse 17. He says, so if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Paul's essentially here saying to Philemon, Hey, Philemon, if I showed up at your place, you would greet me cheerfully, yes? Okay, yes. And you would probably invite me in and, and cook a nice dinner for me, and we'd enjoy a rich fellowship, catching up about our lives and things that we've seen God doing. That's right, right? Oh, yes. And, and, and then you'd let me stay late, and we'd, we'd drink hot cocoa or coffee by the fire, whatever it may be, and, and, and we'd continue in fellowship, and you'd pray for me, and I'd pray. Yes? Okay, then do that to Philemon. Whatever you would do to me, verse 17, do it to him as well. View him as the same as me, the Apostle Paul. Guys, and I just have to say, behind this letter then is such a rich picture of forgiveness. He's asking Philemon to forgive Onesimus, but at the heart of it really is a picture of forgiveness overall, right? Paul had been forgiven. Philemon had been forgiven. Philemon's wife and son had been forgiven. And, And it's interesting I say that because look at verse 18 now. Look at the language that Paul uses. He's just a master wordsmith. Verse 18 If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. This is the great theologian, Paul, using theological, imputational, atonement language to talk about forgiveness. Do you think he's trying to paint a word picture here? I think inevitably he is saying, hey, Philemon, don't forget, you've been forgiven, and so therefore you must forgive right? It's not like Paul's going to come over and do some extra chores for him later on, right? He's using a picture here of forgiveness. And by the way, why did he owe him forgiveness? Look at 19. Oh yeah, uh, Paul led him to faith. (laughs) Paul led him to faith. So how inconsistent would it be for Philemon to not forgive Onesimus when number one, God had forgiven him. And number two, his spiritual mentor and hero in the faith was asking him to do so. I won't take us there. Maybe next week we can go there. But Matthew 18, you know the story. Peter asks, how many times should we forgive? And he says, up to seven times. I mean, the Pharisees do it three. He says, no, 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 Peter, Jesus speaking. Not seven, but what? 70 times seven. And then he goes on to tell that great parable of one who's forgiven the great debt of billions of dollars. And when he's forgiven that debt, he goes and he exacts just a few thousand dollars. And that is an indication of one who's not forgiven. The point is, is that he who is forgiven much, forgives much, right? And when you have an awareness, and I'm talking to us now, when we have an awareness of how much we've been forgiven by God, not just in our past, but even in our present sin, our pride, our anger, our frustration, our spiritual apathy, when we understand how much God's forgiven us, oh, We have no choice but to forgive. Are you with me? We must forgive ongoing because God forgives me a greater debt every single day. I think this is at play here with the scenario of Philemon, which goes back to verse 6 and 7 where it says, hey, you're going to need full knowledge of the gospel. (laughs) You're going to need to think, Philemon, about your position before God theologically. Now, 
Verse 19, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. And he ends with a positive note. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, verse 21, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. And this is why, again, Paul's a little bit elusive here. He's a little bit unclear and he's hinting at things. What is it that he's speaking of in verse 21, doing even more than I say? Well, we don't know for sure. Perhaps emancipation. At the minimum, though, I think he's speaking to Philemon. You need to treat this guy with virtue and with love and with care and in genuine fellowship, right? Potentially even more than that. He closes his letter then in verse 22. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Which is, by the way, why it can't be that he was in Caesarea because he's the one that appealed to Rome from Caesarea. So we know he's in Rome. He wants to come to him in Colossae. Verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let me close with this. I want to just ask, how does this story end? Well, the writings of one great church father survive, and his name was Ignatius. Just at the turn of the century, Ignatius was ministering. And on the road to Rome where he would be killed, he was being transported by the government to be killed, murdered, he wrote several things. And one of the things he wrote was about a pastor. A pastor in the city of Ephesus, actually, some 50 years after this letter was written. And the pastor's name, he was a marvelous pastor, nothing but great things to say. What was his name? His name was Onesimus. Now, surely there could be more than one Onesimus in the Roman Empire, right? And more than one Christian. But what's interesting is that in writing about Onesimus, he uses the exact same pun that the Apostle Paul used in Philemon. He talks about Onesimus, the useful one, being useful, even though he was previously not useful. Very interesting, isn't it? Now, it's not absolutely a closed case, but it sure is positive evidence that this Onesimus is the same one that is being spoken of here in Philemon. If that's the case, then what that means is that Philemon did heed to the appeal of Paul. It means that he let him go. It means that Onesimus not only continued in the faith, but what? He actually became a useful minister, just as Paul said that he was, even a pastor who proclaimed the good news and taught the word. That means that God's providence in working all things for good potentially adds yet another chapter of what's already been an amazing story of him interweaving people's lives together for his good and glory. This man Onesimus who fled the length of the world to escape his master ran into the one, that one, Paul, whom his master owed his life and in so doing he found spiritual life himself. What a story and what a testament of God's sovereign grace.